what would make a United Methodist theologian and church historian, the, the son of a United Methodist pastor, steeped in this tradition, this denomination, uh, teaching at United Methodist Seminary, uh, in the thick of it, become Catholic? Well, there's all kinds of stuff wrapped up in this phenomenal conversion story. My guest is Dr. Justice Hunter. He's talking about miracles, uh, uh, voices, appearing rosaries, digging into the mass, loving the faith, these beautiful prayer traditions and practices, the liturgy of the hours, the rosary, and being drawn in by encountering, uh, through his wife, and actually her being drawn in first, this beautiful, vibrant community of Catholics who wanted to raise their kids together in the faith, to maintain the faith, and to love the faith. This is... a fantastic conversion story, really digs into some of these fundamental questions of theological retrieval, of, of looking at the ancient church, and how to practice those things and remain uh, Protestant, and, and, and loving the, the Catholic faith. I mean, <laughs> everything's in here. It's an amazing conversation. Uh, please watch, please subscribe, leave some comments, get some feedback going, guys. I'd love to hear from you. Uh, and please enjoy this fantastic conversation with Dr. Justice Hunter, a Methodist theologian and church historian who becomes Catholic. Please enjoy. Hey friends, welcome back to the show. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. If you're listening on podcast, thank you. Make sure you follow the show on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever you find the show and leave a rating or review if you can. That helps to push the podcast out to new listeners and expand the mission and mandate of this thing. So thank you for doing that. If you're watching us on YouTube, hi, thanks for watching. Make sure you subscribe to this channel, hit the bell, leave some comments, do all those fun YouTube things that you do and keep it nice in the comments, guys, because it's, it's wild up there sometimes. <laughs> That's scary. We're in for an awesome uh, episode this week. I am joined by Dr. Justice Hunter. He's Associate Professor of Church History at United Theological Seminary. He uh, is a convert to the Catholic faith, has published some works, including If Adam Had Not Sinned, The Reason for the Incarnation from Anselm to Scotus, from Catholic University of America Press in 2020. Uh, he is uh, married and lives with his wife and his four kids uh, in Dayton, Ohio. Uh, thanks for being here, uh, Dr. Hunter. Welcome to the show, uh, and hello. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's good to see you. Yeah, uh, welcome from Ohio. Lots of guests. I love guests from Ohio. We have family down in Ohio, so we're there once in a while. Uh, always yeah. nice to uh, talk to somebody from... Uh, Flyover country. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, I love it. And it, it, the, the cool thing about Ohio, I don't know, um, this is... I mean, obviously, you know this because you're from Ohio, but we, my wife and I are both converts to the Catholic faith, and we were going to Ohio for, for as long as I can remember. When we were dating, we were seeing family down there, and I, I, we didn't realize how 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 Catholics are tucked into yeah. Ohio so nicely until we became converts, and we're looking for a church one Sunday when we were there visiting family, and we're like, oh my gosh, they're the best churches in Ohio. There's some, yeah. really, there's some really awesome Catholic churches that we had no idea about before we became Catholic, and suddenly we're yeah. like, oh, this is kind of like a little... A little Catholic hideaway here in Ohio. We love yeah. it. It's awesome. That's right. I think I think we're our parish is approaching its two hundredth anniversary. That's so, amazing. Yeah, yeah. It's, there are some beautiful, beautiful churches in Southern Ohio, and Dayton. Dayton has some great ones. Yeah, that's fantastic. Okay, so uh, you, good sir, were someone that I reached out to my to the listenership uh, at one point and asked for potential guest names. People they wanted to hear on the show. And you were suggested by multiple people as somebody to be an interesting guest on this show. So whether you, you knew it or not, su surprise. <laughs> a bit. Appar apparently, yeah, you have an interesting story to tell. So um, on this show, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about stories like this. We're, we're talking to people who are looking into the church, wondering about the Catholic mm -hmm. Church, uh, who are newly into the Catholic Church. And I, I find that these stories are the ones that highlight those, those experiences that people can relate to and connect with. Uh, I discovered a show like The Journey Home on EWTN when I was myself first looking into the church. In the very early days of YouTube, it ended up just kind of binging, at, you know, old episodes on, on YouTube for hours and hours and hours before we had kids up to 3 a.m. in the morning. I had nothing else, nothing else to do. 
to do. The, the, those kind of stories, those stories about somebody on a journey resonate because they ask the questions that you ask and they answer questions that you're you're asking and they encounter things that you, that you encounter along the way. And so I love stories like this where we can highlight somebody's journey uh, to give listeners something to, to kind of to dig into and relate to and connect with uh, justice. So I want to get out of the way and let you tell your story. Go back as far back as you want and we'll go forward and we'll dig into things along the way. And uh, the, the, the best feedback I get from this show time and again is that is, is reviews saying the host just shuts up and we love it. So, <laughs> so I am happy to shut up, to shut up <laughs> and let the listeners have what they want. So, so, so tell us, you know, what, where's your story begin? Sure. Yeah. Thank, thanks for the uh, invitation and, yeah. and the time. Um, so I, where does it begin? I mean, in some ways, <laughs> generations back, I suppose. But um, my parents are were raised United Methodist Church, both both of them in the North Alabama Conference. Um, they're both from that part of the country, and they met. My father became the youth pastor, I think, for my mom in my mom's church, and she was like the twenty something um, working working girl that that was helping out with the youth group. And so that was, that was the start of our family. <laughs> and, um, so I was born in, into a, you know, Methodist family. Um, my dad went to seminary shortly after I was born, I believe. And so, uh, at Asbury theological seminary in Lexington, just outside of Lexington, Kentucky. And that was where, you know, Methodist pastors from the South tended to go. Uh, he went to the college and seminary, and then it's, sure enough, that's where I ended up going to the college and seminary as well. I got a, a master of divinity, was was um, contemplating entering the ministry at the time. Um, so, I think I really think my journey into the church. I mean, they my parents introduced me to Christ, and um, and the Methodists I grew up with introduced me to Christ, and. In a certain sense, I think I mentioned you earlier. It's hard to talk about all these threads. Tell your story. I mean, but very importantly, you know, I just sort of followed the Christ they introduced me to um, along the way, and this is where this is where we ended up. Um, there's a lot, a lot more to say about that. Um, I then we bounced around. I guess my at some point, my dad became a free Methodist pastor, which is sort of a little splinter group, um, which has this sort of holiness orientation. Um, in the in the Methodist world, he actually ended up coming back to the United Methodist Church later in life um, and pastoring in both 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 places. I it was rather a confusing ordination situation by the end, I think. <laughs> um, but the, the so I grew up a pastor's kid um, in the Methodist Church. That's all I knew. That was my whole world, um, and had a very serious faith. Um, throughout, you know, there's always that wondering, well, not always, but in my case, there was a wondering period a bit, um, or an exploratory period, I guess, through high school. But by the end of high school, I was really, really committed to to my faith um, when I enrolled at Asbury College. And that was a fruitful time for me um, spiritually. The Asbury College is this Wesleyan holiness school in the middle of nowhere, Kentucky. Um, chapel is a very important part of the culture there. A very serious prayer, and if you know anything about this 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 tradition, um, prayer at the altar is very important in, the, in this tradition. So, tearing at the altar, um, spending time with the Lord was really an important part of the spirituality that, that, that forms people in that tradition, um, which I suppose will always be a part of me. And I, I kind of sort of think about that as sort of a, a gift of this other ecclesial community that I bring with me um, um, to my now Catholic faith. So. I did that. I was totally aimless through college. Um, I did a lot of ministry, a lot of youth ministry, and some some like um, summertime. I, I would do. I did some mission work in summertime, and got to the end of college and had had decided to study Bible and theology and classics, basically, um, which are totally useless degrees when when you go on a job market <laughs> after after you're done. So. So I finished college, got married um, to my wife, Ellen. Uh, we had been friends before college, actually, but then we started dating later in college and got married a week after college was over. And um, I just was, I didn't know what I wanted to do at that point. So I got the only job I could, which was selling uh, Mazdas. And so <laughs> I would sell Mazdas during the day and um, spend time with very colorful characters, as you would imagine. Um, 
And then I'd come home miserable for the most part. The, the work was fine, but I, I derived no joy from it, of course. I'd come home in the evenings. My wife was working for the YMCA of Central Kentucky at the time. And I would just kind of sit down and read theology at night. <laughs> that was just like the way I would kind of decompress and, and find my uh, find happiness. Um, so I did that for months and got more, getting more and more miserable at work and, you know, just reading theology until finally my wife just said, you know, you're miserable. You need to figure out how to do that thing that you do when you come home instead of, you know, selling cars, you know. So, um, so I was like, okay, I guess I'll go to seminary. <laughs> uh, <laughs> off I went to seminary and uh, I just, just wanted to read theology, really. I didn't have a, a, a particular ordination goal or anything in mind. Um, but I was considering any type of ministry. I was pretty, pretty open, but I just knew I wanted to read theology, learn to read theology. Um, so I went to Asbury Seminary where my dad had gone and uh, where my wife had a good job nearby. D I went there. I started studying. I went thinking that I wanted to study modern theology. Um, I had developed a taste for Karl Barth at the time. Um, and quickly, I, I, I had a professor a preaching professor, actually, who had who had graduated from the University of North Carolina, and he he worked in he worked in the history of preaching, and was really interested in early Christian preaching, and he sort of got me hooked on reading early Christianity, um, and it was really the engagement with the fathers that that I think made my made me uncomfortable with, with my Methodist tradition, which is somewhat surprising because I think Methodism historically at least um, participated in this great kind of Anglican return to the early church. John Wesley, for instance, you know, had this passion for that. His dad had a passion for it so much so that actually he enacted um, corporate uh, confession in his, in his church as an Anglican priest at one point, which was not a very popular uh, idea. And <laughs> Wesley also got in some trouble for some of his... Um, some of his discipline he, where he thought he was uh, recreating the early church's discipline about repentance and so on. Anyway, I, uh, I was reading the Fathers. I started reading the Fathers. Um, I got really interested in Augustine. I was reading Augustine pretty, pretty, um, pretty seriously. I mean, you know, I was, I was a master's student, and I had, I had no direction at all. Uh, this professor was interested in, in Augustine, um, but I think he was more into Chrysostom or something like that. And, and, um, he was just throwing books at me basically. And I was just reading them and trying to teach myself anything I could. The faculty at the time just had no one in the area to guide me. And so I just kept reading that. And then I, I, I would sort of rush through my schoolwork and then I would just haunt the library shelves of the fathers and read them. And, read them. and eventually that I got interested in Thomas Aquinas as a result of reading the fathers become interested in medieval theology. I don't know, you know what comes next, you know, and you just kind of keep marching on. Um, so I got interested in Thomas Aquinas towards the end of my time there. When I finished, I had no idea what I wanted to do still, except I still liked reading theology and I knew I wanted to, I wanted to go somewhere where I could learn more about the tradition. Um, I kind of learned all I could on that front from, 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 from the seminary, I thought. And so I didn't know anything about, I didn't know anything about these fields. I'd read some theologians. Um, I got sort of interested in, in the Nouvelle Theologia guys, you know, I was reading a little Delubach, dipping my feet into some of this, this literature. Um, but I didn't have anyone who could guide me into that at, at, at the seminary. So the, I did the thing that was the most rational thing I, I thought I could do. I just applied to a bunch of Catholic schools, assuming that someone at a Catholic school could teach me about early Christianity or, or medieval scholasticism, which is what I was interested in. Um, so I applied to them in master's programs because I thought, I, well, I've not done enough work in these areas to, to go on to a PhD yet. Um, so I just did a bunch of research to find out what master's programs at Catholic schools give students living stipends. Those are, that was, my, that was my, all the criteria I had. And those three things. If you check those boxes, then I applied. Um, and I, I thought, well, you know, we'll see what happens. You know, I might be going back to selling cars after this, but well, we'll try this thing. Um, I got, I, I ended up, you know, accepting an offer to come to the University of Dayton. And at the time, Matthew Levering was here. 
um, at the university. He's not, he's no longer here, but Matthew Levering was here. And Matthew, um, obviously someone who can, who could, who, who is a trustworthy guide into all that literature. So I came here and spent two years of doing a master's here at the university of Dayton. Sorry, I lived in Dayton. That's why I keep saying here. Um, and, and there, I just sort of, you know, felt conf very confirmed that this was the research I wanted to do, and particularly um, research in the middle and medieval theology and in historical theology and history of doctrine, all these types of um, areas that Matthew works in. But I still wasn't, um, I, I, I was honestly a bit off put from, uh, with respect to Catholicism, from my experience um, in, a, you know, in, a, in a Catholic university of that type. Um, I just sort of, it didn't look too different to me from sort of Methodism. Um, I don't know what was going on there. And at the time, my wife, had, my wife was not in the least bit interested in the idea of, 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 um, of entering the church. So, so, so we stayed Methodist, uh, and, um, well, actually I had been free Methodist up to that point because, because my parents were, but I, that we moved here and there were no free Methodist churches, so we couldn't be free Methodist anymore. So we became United Methodist at that point in time. Um, I'm, I'm really droning on. Is this, is this pace okay? <laughs> no, 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 no. You're it's good? It's fantastic. It's fantastic. All right, all right. I'll keep marching then. Um, so then, then I, what happened? This was Dayton. I spent two years here reading with Matthew and the faculty. Um, Bill Portier was a faculty member here at the time, and he was he was really help, helpful in sort of guiding me into some of the literature around the Vatican II and the Communio stuff um, that I was a little interested in, all that Dillebach stuff. Um, but but it became clear to me then, no, what I really want to study is um, medieval scholasticism. I want to study the history of doctrine and the way in which um, the medievals were um, reflecting upon scripture in light of the commentary of the fathers on the, on the scriptures and then um, engaging with questions of their day in that way. And that was what really, really captivated me. So I got to the end of my time at UD, University of Dayton, and I did the exact same thing. I made a list of schools. Um, well, this time I, I, I made a list of schools that had two faculty that I wanted to work with. I figured two was what I needed. Um, if, if there were two, then then, then I would be set. One would not be enough. You know, one, one, one person would not be enough, but. Um, but I didn't didn't hope to have a lot more than two to have um, to, to fit kind of my criteria what I was looking for. <coughs> um, so I applied and you know the offers came back and 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 it became clear that that Southern Methodist University was the place for me to go. Um, the reason why was because in my estimation, SMU had, the best Methodist theologian in America, Billy Abraham, um, and the one of the best Catholic theologians, arguably the best Catholic theologian in America, Bruce Marshall, um, who is my doctoral advisor. And I just thought, well, that that nothing can get better than than that situation for <laughs> for my interest, who I am. I'm a Methodist. Um, I I had been uh, received a John Wesley Fellowship, which is which was um, kind of significant it's significant financial contribution and also network in the in the united methodist theological kind of society world and so um i thought okay this is this is this is the thing to do i went to smu um and that was the that was those four years were the most kind of formative years of my life um I mean, nothing touches being a dad and, and spouse, you know. But in terms of professional, uh, academic, it there I really I, I sort of finally tasted what I'd been so hungry for for so long, um, because it was a very rigorous training we received, um, and and especially working with working with the two of those two those two scholars um, over time. I'm, Bruce Marshall is my advisor. He, his interests really uh, met. Not close, most closely on what on, on what I was interested in, um, and and he, you know he is my most formative teacher, but just something about the environment there it was rigorous. There was they worked well, really well together, and the sort of demand they placed upon us for our attention 
to the tradition and sensitivity to the tradition, combined with an interest in and a sort of a sort of fearlessness um, and confidence in the faith and its capacity to 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 guide us into whatever you know whatever the world throws at us. Um, that was just that was simply remarkable, and I, I just hooked you know I, I was I was I'm just all in you know at this point. But I was still Methodist. I mean, um, the Methodists were funding my education, and um, and um, I was gr- gaining more and more opportunity in the Methodist theological world all along. Um, uh, you know, got very involved in the Wesleyan Theological Society and some other other um, societies, and holding coming to hold offices and those sorts of things. So, um, sort of felt. Okay, this is this is this is I guess the direction I'm headed. I'm going to be a Methodist theologian. Um, got to the end of my time there, and again, you know, throwing job applications out there. You know, grad school is kind of funny. You you do all this work, and then you get to the end, and you're still not sure you're actually going to have a career in this field. You know, <laughs> and and so you know, I did what everyone else does. I think I wrote 50 applications, just like. Um, trying to convince myself, well, I could teach that, you know, um, and be happy. But what ended up opening up was, was the position I'm, I'm in now at United Theological Seminary um, here in Dayton, which is a United Methodist Seminary. United Methodist Church has 13 seminaries. We're one of those 13. And um, and an opening came up. I had, I'd honestly, I'd happen, I went to church with the dean um, when I was a student at the University of Dayton, and so he reached out and just said, hey, just want to let you know we have this opening um, if you, we'd like you to apply, you know. Um, and things lined up, and here we came, and, and here I was. So we moved to Dayton, um, and, you know, here, here I was. I had been a John Wesley Fellow. Uh, the United Methodist Church had supported me, nurtured me, um, led me through grad school, was putting me in positions of, you know, um, I don't know, theological influence or something like that. And, and, um, and now here I was teaching theology and history, um, to Methodist seminarians at a Methodist seminary. Um, and that, that just all made, that just all made sense, right? <laughs> like it's just how it goes. And <laughs> we were quite content. We had been in a church in Dallas, Texas, where my wife and, and, and I, we were all very happy. Um, we had a very healthy kind of evangelical Methodist congregation there. Um, it was kind of, it was vibrant and growing and, and there were lots of young families and, and that sort of thing. And, and, and it had a very rich kind of discipleship background to it. Um, it was a really strong, small group system and this sort of thing. Um, and so we were very content there with Methodism. When we moved here we found a church that was that was that also had you know it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't a bad Methodist church or anything um, that we joined and we we you know we've always been sort of all in Christians my wife and I both you know I mean we we met well we met through a through a youth ministry program outreach program in high school we both were extremely involved in Young Life um, if you know that parachurch organization through college um, we. You know, any church we go to, we we're there every Sunday. We do all the stuff, and we usually end up on you know service <laughs> roles. Um, we've always been all in, you know, um, and so we were all in, you know, here. And several things happened um, over time. One was, well, let me back up a bit. I became totally committed to. The idea that one thing I wanted to do for my students, maybe the most important thing I could do for my students, was to introduce them to the tradition um, that I had fallen in love with. You know, that that became for me, it became abundantly clear for, to me that that was that was what I wanted to do. That was what I was called to do. You know, I think sort of a, a, a you know a, a mission to do that, and that. And it lined up perfectly with my school because they were looking for someone who could do that with their students. They, the values of our school are histor- the historic faith, um, 
scriptural holiness and church renewal. So they had people who did the other thing sort of more vocally, but they, they really wanted someone to come in and, and teach the historic faith, as they call it. Um, and so, so everything kind of fit together there. But I, I just kept, you know, reading the tradition, teaching the tradition. And always in the back of my mind, I had a I will, my, my doctoral advisor, Bruce Marshall, he's a convert from Lutheranism, um, one, of those, one of the many. You know, there, there was that big brain drain from the ELCA back in the, as in the 90s or something like that. Like, all their best theologians became Catholic, or, <laughs> if, if you know the story. Um, and he was one of, the, one of those theologians, you know. And, and so, and he had been, you know, he was a doctoral advisor, but also, also a, a spiritual kind of um, guide in some ways. And so... And that relationship just has continued. And so, I, you know, always in the back of my mind, I thought, you know, if, 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 if I remember saying at one point, you know, if not for all these, uh, for, if not for all these attachments, uh, Bruce, I think I would be Catholic now, you know, it's just all the attachments and, um, and it's not, the attachments aren't bad, you know, the attachments are good. Um, I think God has given them to me and they're a blessing to my life, you know, and my students, um, my my colleagues, my family, um, you know, but I just couldn't figure out how, how to, um, maintain those, be loyal to those attachments in the right way. Um, and can, and move forward on, on, um, my interest in Rome, which, had, which had just kind of been abiding along the way. I mean, you read, you read the, the fathers, you read, you read the scholastics and you sort of grow more. I was just, interested in the, what their worship life was like, you know, and, and some of those things are just kind of absent in, in the, in the worship and spiritual life that I was experiencing. Confession, for instance, um, you know, I was reading Scotus's commentaries on pen, you know, c comments on penance or something. I was like, Oh, wow. Well, how can I do that? Oh, you can't. Oh, okay. All right. Um, so, so anyway, this is getting mashed up in my mind. Let me try to get back on the narrative. <clears throat> I came here. I started um, started working here. I was writing. I sort of had two streams of publication going, and you probably see this if you look at my CV. One is you know sort of medieval theology stuff, and the other is is Methodist stuff. Um, I, I just kept I just kept getting invited to write um, write for Methodist outlets, write about Methodist topics. Um, you know, write Methodist books. I got asked to do a basically like a, a catechism book for a Methodist publisher, um, which is still selling quite well, actually. Um, and and so I just sort of even in my publication, it's sort of like these two minded thing in my life. And so I just kept doing that going forward. That career path made total sense. You know, it's just sensible. Um, a few things happened. A few things happened uh, in our life. Some of them, like cr some crisis things happened in our life, which I think kind of changed the trajectory of several several um, aspects of our life that then made made the the move to the church to the, to the Catholic faith possible and then sensible and then necessary. Sorry, Keith. I, <coughs> I, did, I lectured too much this weekend. My my, my throat's a little dry. Let me get a little more tea in there. I'll talk some more that. <laughs> Cut this moment out. <coughs> oh. I'm cleared. I lost my voice for two weeks. I had to cancel like five interviews. Oh, yeah. It was just, I thought, every day I thought, oh, can I do it now? Can I? Nope. And I'd try it. Nope. No. Nope. Yeah. It was brutal. Yeah. All right. I think I'm going to do it. Um, so several things happened. Um, one thing is very oddly, my next door neighbor had a, he had always struggled with, um, I think OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. And he had a tendency to try to treat himself with alcohol for this. And, and I gather, I'm not certain, you know, from the outside that, that there were problems, tensions in the marriage go, going on there that were exacerbating this cycle and for some reason he sort of fixated on me um with his obsession and 
he just sort of became obsessed with the fact that, you know, I didn't mow my lawn frequently enough or I didn't edge things properly or, you know, the house probably needed a new, a new coat of paint or, or the garage, you know, or something like that. With all this sort of stuff. Um, <clears throat> well, it, 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 it came to the point where honestly, you know, the, it was almost unbearable to, to live there. I mean, he, he think the things, you know, just various forms of harassment, none of them quite illegal enough to take any steps. Um, and so, uh, you know, I had some counsel with some, a friend of mine, uh, one of my colleagues is, is, uh, He's Sicilian um, American and and just you know kind of someone you would see in Goodfellas maybe and he's got a lot of um, he he does a really like scary inner city ministry work in like the, the drug drug area high high drug and high high trafficking areas of Dayton um, amazing man but he. I, I was, he'd worked with law enforcement a lot in his ministry. So I was talking to him, getting some advice, and you know, he had some friends. And basically it became clear that our options were um, to just uh, tolerate this level of, of, of harassment or, you know, um, wait till it escalates to something worse and then and then take steps that you could do something. So um, we decided that um, we, we didn't like those two options, so we were going to have to move, basically. And this wasn't the worst thing because the house was a was a, a thousand square feet, and we had the three kids at the time. <laughs> yeah. And so, so you know, it was kind of necessary, also. So anyway, um, we moved. We moved kind of across town, and that coincided with a period where the, where our Methodist church was was frankly just falling apart. Um, there had been some internal divisions that kind of came to the to the front and is you know this is stuff that predated us there and and it was in one of these weird kind of umbrella arrangements where there's like this big mega church and they took in this smaller church and they were trying to do ministry through that church is you know doing a lot of important recovery work in in this um in this um low-income community here in dayton and we, we were engaged with that as we could be um and things just sort of fell apart there, coincident with our need to move. Um, and the move coincided with my sabbatical. So rather than just, you know, find a house because of the market, we moved the family to Tennessee where my in-laws live. They, they, have, uh, they had, they had a, a retirement home that they had purchased that they hadn't moved into yet, basically. So we could move in there. And then I remodeled the house, sold the house, and bought another house. So we had this like three or four month gap where we just sort of pulled out a life here, plugged back in. And when we, we plugged back in, my wife shocked me and said, you know, I think we should just go to mass instead of going back to a Methodist church. <laughs> so I was like, oh, really? You know, like, that, that, that surprises me. Well, it turns out she had been... I mean, I knew some of this was going on, but I, did, I didn't know the depth of it. She had been um, increasingly dissatisfied with mainline Protestantism, um, in part because she felt less and less supported in her calling to the to 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 raise a Christian family. Um, she, you know, I mean, I remember one of the, one of the last Sundays we were at that church. Someone preached a sermon that said, you know, um, basically, you know, women need to feel empowered and go work in the workplace. And if you stay home, then, you know, that's oppression or something like that you know, from the pulpit. And I mean, I don't, I think, I don't think that person was invited, <laughs> invited to preach again. <laughs> um, but, but, but it wasn't, it wasn't an attitude that was reflected a, a total minority report among yeah. the attitudes yeah. there. And, and that combined with the fact that I think she just sort of she found herself having less and less um, partners in the life that she was leading um, in that in that community. We were we had started homeschooling our boys at this point, and the homeschool community we were a part of was a Catholic homeschool community that some of my classmates at the University of Dayton were a part of when we moved back, and so they'd gotten us tied in this Catholic homeschooling community. Um, 
we sent Justice, our oldest, to a to a, a parochial school. We moved back initially. It's across the street from my, my seminary. But the school was in really kind of, it, it, its best days were definitely behind it. This was pretty clear. Um, and he really struggled there. And so we thought, we can't do that. Um, I don't know if you know anything about the Dayton public school system, but it's one of the worst in the country. So you don't want to send your kids to public school in Dayton. And we were looking at the options and we just thought, well, let's try the homeschool thing. We have friends who seem to do this well in this community. Let's try it with them. And that was just a salve for her, especially. And for, our, I mean, for, for justice as well, he just sort of healed and kind of came back to himself by the end of the year. And we've just continued doing that ever since. And, so Ellen's doing this. She's going to church at the Methodist Church. We're doing ministry. We're, um, you know, we have a we have a small group of people that we meet with and pray with in that community. It's, but then there's this other um, community of people that she's also living life with, and they, and there she's finding finding these moms that, um, you know, are are like her, you know, really on their knees, praying for their children, um, seeking, seeking to, how does one do this difficult journey of raising children, um, um, in the faith, um, in a community. And that group just became the, they became her sisters, basically, you know, um, the people who locked arms with her. And over time I watched, they became her most important spiritual relationships to um, um, these women were, were many of them are still our closest friends. You know, they're just, they were, there were people she admired who had things to teach her. She thought, and were, were interested in the questions she was asking the pursuits she was, she was after. And, and over time <laughs> she started out, she told me, I remember, I remember this distinctly that they would meet, for the for the homeschool co-op they meet and they play pray the rosary together is the first thing they do before they before they get for the end of the day and um she that every family has it takes turns leading the rosary and <laughs> she was you know she was all you know extremely stressed about this the first year and finally i think she told a friend like i just i can't i can't do it you know i can't do it and so she took us to go for um <clears throat> And then the next year, she was like, well, I think I can pray some of it, you know. Um, um, and I think she worked with the courage, and then she kind of started. It's like, well, you know, okay. Um, all these all these people that I, whose faith I really admire, and, and um, I'm convinced they're following the same Christ I'm following, they pray the rosary a lot, you know. Um, and, and it's important to them. It's an important formative part of their faith. And so I guess I can try praying the rosary a little bit. And um, around that time, she's in the basement of our house uh, doing laundry, you know, thinking about this. And she looks up and there are a pair of rosary beads hanging from like a nail in our basement. <laughs> oh, we, oh. <laughs> I know we, we still have no idea where they came from. Um so she was like, okay, that's all the sun. That's all I, <laughs> yeah, and, right. And I was just like, just there on the wall. We've seen that wall a thousand times. It's never been there. There it is. Um, there. Yeah. So she was like, okay, I guess, I guess I should pray the rosary, you know, um, there are a lot of other cool stories. Things happen. I mean, my, my voice heard her, my son heard a voice calling him in, in the, um, while playing in the backyard <laughs> and, <clears throat> He can tell the story better than I. I don't remember the details, but for whatever reason, it was crystal clear to him that it was Christ calling him to the Catholic Church. Wow. He was. This was my oldest son at the time, and so you know, all these things start happening. Um. So all this starts happening in our life. We start going to mass, and again, I said to Ellen, "Look, this is good. I'd I'd, I'd love to go to mass." Um, I'm not sure how this works with the fact that I'm, you know, a rising Methodist theologian or something, you know, but, you know, I, 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 I need some spiritual, I needed some spiritual kind of, I needed some nourishment at that point in time. I've been through 
pretty, pretty traumatic experience with my neighbor and all, all the chaos going on there. Um, and also, you know, working in a major institution and kind of the thick of a, a, a denomination like, like Methodism, it can, it's getting to be a little bit of a grind to deal with Methodist conversation and politics at the office in the way I was. And then to go to church and kind of feel still in that world. Um, I have many colleagues that do that, but I just thought, you know, it wouldn't be bad to take a little break <laughs> from Methodism, um, to, especially because if you, if you know anything about Methodism right now, I mean, it's, it's in really dreadful uh, state of affairs politically right now. And being in one of the seminaries, you know, all that it's, it's also there, you know, we, we kind of go through those same chaotic and we're dealing with the same chaos. So, so I thought, okay, well, we'll just do this for a little while. It'll, it'll also be good for the kids. They can, build, you know, deepen their friendships with, with these with these kids at the co-op, homeschool co-op. And so we did, we started going to mass and, you know, once you stop, you just can't stop. I mean, start, you just can't stop really. I mean, it's kind of was our experience, you know. Um, <laughs> but I said to Ellen, you know, when we started, I said, well, that's, you know, that's good. But look, we, we can't, you and I, we've never... We, ne we never just like go half in when we go to church, right? So if we're going to go to mass, um, we, we're going to do, we're going to do the Catholic thing. You know, we're not just going to pop in on Sunday. We're going to, you know, we want to learn how to pray, you know, like Catholics do. Um, you know, uh, we want to, we can, you know, we can't make a confession, but you know, we're you're supposed to do that. How often are Catholic? We've, <laughs> there's all these questions for us. It's starting, it's starting to learn, you know, um, how, how often are you supposed to go to confession? You know, well, can we go do something in there? You know, that often to you know, let's just try this rhythm out. You know, and um, you know, no surprise. You know, about a year later, she's like, I think I'm going to go to RCI. <laughs> 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 I was like, oh man, that, you know, what are you talking about? I'm like, you know, four or five years into my career here, ten years coming up. Um, the school has, you know, plans for me into the future, being kind of this Methodist person. And what's what's going on here? So she, so this, that's that's kind of the start of it. Now, after that, all of this happened in the thick of all of this transition. We'd started going to mass, started kind of praying, praying um, in Catholic ways, I guess. Um, experiencing all the kind of different uh, different facets of Catholic life. While we're doing that, my father was diagnosed with cancer, um, and he, I mean, he ran a marathon in November of 2018, I think, and he was he was dead into November of 20, 2019. Wow. Wow. So he was diagnosed January of that year, I think, um, and and so <clears throat> that that became you know the the huge kind of burden and and really the kind of spiritual emotional personal um hole that i was pouring everything into um, as you'd imagine um, and the family as well we were all just grieving and going through this process together ellen started rcia when dad was you know in the august of that that year while he, after he'd been diagnosed and he passed in november um and i just I just said, you know, I said, you know, I am feeling pulled this direction also, but I just, I don't have it in me to think all that through and work all through, through that right now. I just, you know, I just, I just don't have, don't have it in me to go to RCIA class, pray, th pray about entering the church and so on. And I, and, 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 and combined with the fact that, and to sort through what this means for me vocationally, what it means for me professionally, um, mm -hmm. what it means about us financially, you know, I'm a sole breadwinner. Um, uh, I just don't have the energy for that at this time. My dad was a United Methodist pastor at the time. Um, and so, so she said, uh, you know, that's fine. I'll, I'll just go, I'll start, I'll start going to RCIA. So she started going to RCIA that year. Um, he died and that really disrupted the process. So, so she stepped back that year. Um, but with no, I mean, she had no reservations. She was, she was pretty committed, but, but we all just, you know, kind of stepped back and grieved that in the process though, I had friends praying with me, Methodist friends that were important prayers, but I'll never forget. I had a friend, um, a friend at, 
at um, the parish who I was talking to, and he he just said he said to me he's a very very good very good Catholic man I admire him quite a lot actually he's a little, little older than me, and my friend Peter said, Justice, we got to pray you know let's pray right now which is which is you know. That's not always something you, you've experienced in the Catholic world, <laughs> in the normal kind of Dayton parish. Um, but you know, I think I think I think the Spirit's renewing the church and, and and people in this way, and I find it more and more. But he said, you know, we got to pray right here and right now. Um, and he started praying for me, and the the thing he prayed was so different than the things I'd been praying otherwise. It was so significant. He just kept praying. God, please unite Justice's sufferings with the sufferings of Christ. And he prayed that several times, and I'd never, I'd never heard that idea before. Apart from the fathers, you know, maybe, um, but but never like a part of my faith. And also, you know, I'd, I'd never experienced the the this is this is easily the most kind of difficult thing I'd, I'd, I'd experienced, and um, that was so consoling to me. It was so consoling to me. And, and I think that that was, that was really kind of an important step in me. I think coming to, to understand what the Catholic faith is about in a way that I hadn't understood before that, um, about what it means to be united to Christ in all things, including sharing in his sufferings, as Paul says, of course. Um, but, but then to live a life that is united to him in that way as well. And for it to be something that is, um, it is solace, but it also is like the alignment of the soul, the proper alignment of the soul um, in this world. So it's what you do, it, what you ought, or what's suitable to do with these experiences. And we from that vantage point, going to mass then after that, and um, and joining in the sacrifice of the mass as I could, um, it made me want to be really united to Christ, you know, um, and I and I couldn't be. Um, the, to, 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 to the extent, um, I could be spiritually united to Christ, but I couldn't, there was more, it occurred to me. And so fast forward another year, my wife goes back to RCIA. I'm sitting back here thinking, well, this is not that serious. There is no way she's actually going to do it. I don't, I, I, I do not believe it's going to actually happen until it happens. Um, and because she was from a, um, Independent Christian churches is her background, and that tradition is, is quite um, not not openly hostile to Catholicism, I would say, but not in the least bit interested, and about as far away from yeah, Catholicism yeah. in terms of practice, I, I think, um, as Protestantism comes. Very low church Protestantism. She's from East Tennessee. You know, she knew a couple Catholics in, in grade school, but they all were sort of like a foreign, you know, alien monster or something. Um, and so, so it is a huge, it was a huge step for her. Um, uh, when she told me she wanted to go to RCIA at first, the first year, I think she was just like, I want to learn a little more about what we've been doing. You know, I'm not sure about it. The second year just went back and it just became clearer and clearer that, Oh no, I think, I think Ellen is going to be Catholic, um, <laughs> this year. And sure enough, um, come, well, not Easter. We were, she was going to enter the church at Easter, but that was the COVID year. And so, um, so, you know, I think Pentecost was the first Sunday we opened back up here. And so at Pentecost, um, she went up, our two daughters were baptized. Um, she and the boys were confirmed. Um, they'd been baptized, you know, um, previously in the Methodist church or the Christian church. And, um, <clears throat> received their first communion. I was up on, I got to got to go up with them because our daughters were being, were being baptized and hold my daughter through the process. But, but I actually, I did it. I didn't go, I didn't join with them. Um, the reason was I, I, I'd, I'd started thinking about it. I, I, I'd, <laughs> I'd been dealing with my dad's passing and I just wasn't, I still wasn't quite ready to think about that question yet. But I also, um, didn't know what it would mean professionally for me. And I knew that this is my livelihood and all these people who, who are becoming Catholics. Livelihood. So, um, I received some good counsel from several people. Um, um, 
the the advice I got was, I mean, make your way, but but you know, well, you know, don't stop moving toward the church. <laughs> don't 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 stop moving to the church. Um, but you know, make your way prayerfully and with some haste. You know, but but you know, you need to sort. You do need to sort out these other. Um, responsibilities, and the thing I couldn't sort out was, you know, what my what what were my responsibilities to to my employer and to my students. And the students were very important to me. Um, what, what were my responsibilities to my Methodist students? So once it became clear that she was going to enter the church, COVID happens. She actually enters the church. Um, then. I just kind of went into full on prayer mode about what I needed to do. And so I started praying. I was praying. We were praying. I wasn't sure if I would lose my job if I, if I entered the church. Um, I wasn't sure what the response of my colleagues would be. Um, and I had a conversation with my dean, um, who, who's a close friend and, and has been a real mentor to me um, professionally. I think this is probably in August of the next year. COVID made everything weird too. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we were having lunch and he said to me, well, Ellen's, Ellen's Catholic now, huh? And I said, yeah, yeah, she's Catholic. He said, and you're not going to go, you're not going to a Methodist church anytime soon, are you? And I said, no, I don't think I'm, I, I don't know if I'll, I don't know how I would ever go back to it, to it, worship in a Methodist church, to be honest with you at this point. Um, he said, and he said, well, I suppose that means you want to become Catholic, huh? I said, well, I, yeah, I kind of want to, <laughs> but I really don't, I mean, I'm, I, what do you, I don't know what it means. And, um, and he said, he said, you know, well, um, I'd like us to have Catholic faculty, but I don't know that I would like you to be our Catholic faculty. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, that was his initial response, you know, um, which, which, which was fair. I mean, um, I think that, that we kind of, we had a kind of Methodist thing going, you know, there and, uh, and I was a part of that kind of trajectory for the school and the future. And, um, and my, my transition really disrupted the, the plans and how they had been imagined for the future um, at our school in that respect, I think. And so, you know, I think it just initially was like, uh, this is, this is, this is too much of a diversion for how I imagine our faculty to go into the future, you know, and I just don't want to deal with that. Um, so that was his initial response. So I just thought I went home and, and I talked to my, to spiritual director, I had a spiritual director, um, Franciscan, um, and, I told him about it, you know, I said, well, you know, we've been praying and this is what, this is the conversation I had. And he's like, well, you know, um, we need to pray about this and see what happens. Well, you know, I think a week later, he himself self-initiated a conversation with me. He said, Justice, I want to tell you, you know, I've been thinking about our conversation and I think I misspoke. I've been thinking about it more. And, you know, I just want you to know, I support you, whatever you want to do. We just want you here. And, um, you know, I think if you're Methodist, that's good. If you're Catholic, that's good. You know, there are pluses and minuses either way for the school. So I don't want you, so he said, so I don't want you to think about the school at all. Um, from my perspective, you know, I don't want you to think about the school at all when you make the decision, just, just do what, do what, um, you want, what you think is appropriate. Which I thought one was a remarkable, um, show of um yeah, yeah. of kindness and sincerity and support um to me but also just a sign from god you know that 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 the opening would be there so at that point i was like i signed up for rcia the next week you know <laughs> 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 so then i then you know i started doing that um i i'd been talking to a lot of people praying about it um again my advisor bruce marshall was very um a very important listening ear to me in the process and once we had that conversation, my tenure case was coming up um, that year. So 
I thought I was, I was just sort of praying about it, thinking about it. And I just, it suddenly occurred to me, like, um, I think the worst thing I could do is get tenure at the Methodist seminary and then become Catholic immediately after that. I just thought that would be totally dishonest. You know, <laughs> um, I, I, you know, that's not fair to my colleagues. You know, I don't want to, I don't, and it's not a good witness for the, for the church. Um, it's not a good witness for the church. Um, so, so I sort of think about it and I talked to my priest and decided, well, we need, you know, I think RCA had started. I can't remember how, man, the timeline's getting all matched up. I should have mapped this out beforehand. <laughs> I talked to my priest and he was giving me some counsel about it. And I was, I just realized like, no, if I'm going to do this, I need to just do it. I need to tell my colleagues I'm doing it and apply for tenure. And they need to make the deci- that decision knowing that I'm going to be a Catholic member of this faculty um, going forward. Um, and I just need to trust God that that's going to, that that's going to go how it goes. So um, that took a lot of prayer, you know, um, it's kind of an <laughs> anxious moment to throw yourself out there, but that's what I did. I told my colleagues, look, I'm becoming Catholic. Um, I've been praying about it quite a lot. We've been going to mass and the family's Catholic. They knew what the family had, had become Catholic um, and and into the church, and I said, I've decided I'm going to do this um, next Easter. Um, and then, you know, I sent them my application materials. And um, thanks be to God, they approved them, you know, unanimously. So um, it was just really, a really also very touching, strong show of support. So, you know, it's sort of a, a mix of miracles and this, that, and the other. And then um, um, my week in uh, trepidation, my trepidation was, you know, slow on the way, but it just sort of came together in the end. And that's how, you know, the Methodist theologian at the Methodist seminary from the Methodist family, uh, ends up a Catholic, I guess. (laughs) Uh, it's fantastic, Justice. I gotta say, okay, so first of all, you have just, uh, overtaken my good friend, Tish Oxenreiter, had a record of 45 minutes of unbroken storytelling <laughs> on this podcast. So congratulations. You have officially overtaken Tish by about 10 minutes or so as the uh, longest uh, unbroken story told on this podcast. So you're, you are now the, the record to beat. You'll go down again for me. That's wonderful. Jeez. I'll let Tish know after we finish this, uh, right. this conversation. The Protestant preachers can go on forever. Uh, they, know, can, so. they can. You've been, <laughs> you've, you've been trained well. <laughs> Oh, that's fantastic. Okay, so I I think that's an amazing story for so many reasons. I love that, uh, you know, your wife encounters these these Catholics in this homeschool community that really, you know, draw her in with with their faith in that community. I mean, you know, we're in a similar, in a similar boat. I mean, we were, we were both, it's like, you know, our stories were, are, were parallel for a lot of reasons in, in, mm. in, in places. My wife and I were, were deeply involved in our non-denominational church uh, for, for a long time in every ministry you could imagine, doing small yeah. groups, outreach. We ran the marriage prep stuff for a while. We did all kinds of things. And when we left that, left that church, we kind of thought, well, how are we ever going to find a, a community in the Catholic church? Mm-hmm. The, the joke was on us that after we left, all of our friends that we had that we knew from there, that we knew so well, that we lived our lives with, we actually moved closer to them geographically to be closer to our friends downtown in the city we were, we were living. They slowly, one by one, fell away from the faith to a point where mm. actually none of them go to that church or church at all anymore. Oh gosh, which is crazy because you yeah. know you know looking our our vision for the, our future with raising our kids together and mm-hmm. our long term goals that we thought we had this plan before we became um, Catholic was to raise our our kids with these other faithful Christian families mm-hmm. in this non denominational church. Uh, surprise to us, you know, well, we became Catholic. First surprise, second surprise, that community kind of fell apart, right? And that mm-hmm. church actually fell mm-hmm. apart afterwards. It had a bit of a schism and. And, yeah. and, and yeah. broke up. So, I mean, that, that was amazing. Yeah. And then for, for us, I mean, in a similar way, we've now moved cities, this new city. We thought, how can we find a Catholic community? And like you say, my wife and found an awesome community of, of Catholic moms who are doing what she's doing, you know, raising, yeah. raising the kids, very similar values, similar. Yeah. And, you know, and, and it, it's amazing. Like, you know, God provides these amazing communities and I, and I think you're so right, Justice, in the fact that those kinds of communities really do seem far and few between. Is that the expression? Few and far between? I think I missed yeah, that up. 
<laughs> right? It seemed to be harder to find, I think, in some of the circles that we used to find those things in. I think, I think that's right. right. And, and, and I, we're, we're meeting other Catholic converts who are, like we did, like you guys are doing, yeah. finding, finding that place in, in Catholic communities and going, yeah, these are the values that we held as, as yeah. non-Catholic Christians yeah. are, 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 are being expressed in this way, in these Catholic communities where we lost them, we lost them elsewhere, right. which I think is, is, yeah. is remarkable. I think that's amazing yeah. that, that you guys experienced that kind of similar thing too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. I think, I think that's right. I mean, I sort of, a lot of, a lot of the, my, ch one thing I think is true for us is, you know, we, we were from these kind of very evangelical yeah. um, background growing up. And, you know, evangelicalism in the 90s, um, if you were a teen, it was a great time to be an evangelical teen <laughs> in the 90s. You know, you had all the fish t-shirts and like a thousand bands and concerts. And there's just all this culture, all this Christian culture um, that sort of sat, you could set in a lot of places, I think sort of could saturate your world and fill it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I just didn't, f f that was great for that phase of life, you know. Um, there's something about kind of growing up, having kids. Um, I, there wasn't the thick culture that we were looking for from the faith to kind of um, take us and make us, you know, the unique thing that Christ we thought Christ was calling us to do um, in our in our in at least in the parts of you know the Protestant world that we were inhabiting. So um, I do think there's something about that. It's almost like I got hooked on hooked on being all in for Jesus, you know, <laughs> at a youth rally as a kid. And then I was just kind of kept looking for that. Had it in college at that kind of Wesleyan holiness um, school where prayer was so central and, and these types of things. But after that, you know, um, we had some good places. I don't, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't want to, I still love a lot of those people and, and um, believe in, believe in, um, the, I believe that, you know, they are, you know, people who, I care about and I think reflect great virtue and charity and so on and and um, would be honored for my kids to imitate them in many ways but but in terms of like the holistic um, shaping I, I just kind of church has just held on to all the gifts you know it's like like the, the full dose um, of stuff that we needed um, things that the, it's it's just much more companionable or something I don't know I was hesitating to say you know but but um, that's what I struggled to find um, that I was really looking for. Um, how do you pray when you're a dad? You know, um, how, how do you pray when your kid's up at 3 a.m.? Um, your two-year-old's up every night at 3 a.m. <laughs> still, you know. Yeah. How do you handle that and still. your attention with your spouse and you're mad at her because you're both exhausted? Um, and, you know, she left dirty dishes somewhere. I mean, it's nothing like that. I mean, that's just a silly thing. But, you know the sort of mundane challenges of the life um, that, that I was, you know, that you really struggle with when, when you live the, <laughs> the family life. Um, and, you know, what, do, lo and behold, you know, um, there are the, there are the hours for you, you know, here's what you do, get up and pray the Psalms, you know, and then pray them before bed and do an examine, you know, um, before you fall asleep at night. And I was like, what's up? This is, this is news to me, you know, you know? Um, so I think, yeah, that, that, that was huge. Yeah. Yeah. We're on the same wavelength. The two year old up at 3am still check wife's, yeah. wife's dishes, man, check. We're on the, we're on the same wavelength here. <laughs> Things we need to pray about. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah I, I had an amazing experience of our, our second, our second child, when she was first born, a cold winter, uh, full of snow. And I found just beauty in rocking her and praying the rosary. Yeah. Right. I had no beads. I just kind of was going in my head by counting. And I'm sure I counted more or less a bunch of times yeah. and didn't, didn't do it properly. It doesn't even matter. <laughs> but the beauty, in, and then and then someone said to me, hey, you know what? She's going to she's gonna have a, a memory of, of that deep in her, like, developing mm -hmm. brain of hearing her dad's voice praying the rosary. And I thought, yeah. that's... That's you know, that's deep magic, right? That's mm -hmm. amazing. That's amazing stuff to, to think about. Yeah. And you're right. You find that kind of thing. You f you find that kind of all in for. Now you find some not in at all for Jesus in the Catholic Church, but you yeah, also find this, of course, right? And the Methodist Church too, I guess, also, yeah. right? The same, the same right. thing. But you, but you that all in for Jesus. That's there. Like that's yeah. the kind of thing we're talking about, right? Yeah. That that kind of. Yeah. 
that deep stuff, right? I think that's, yeah. I think that's, that's remarkable. Yeah. My wife still leads me into a lot of this stuff. Um, you know, she, she prays the divine mercy chaplet over the girls every night, you know, to kind of, and that's, that's, that's how my daughters now, that's how they kind of calm yeah, down and go yeah. into sleep, you know? And so I was like, Oh, I'll start doing that, you know? <laughs> and so I just like, hang on. And, you know, instead of kind of, you know, usually she'll leave or I'll leave whoever's up there. And so it started, you know, she started doing it and then, you know, she's like, well, you gotta, you know, I'm not gonna be up there to pray the chaplet. You gotta pray it over them. So, they, so now, you know, so now I think pretty much every night I, I just like, I'm actually gonna hang out and we'll pray the divine mercy chaplet over them together. And, um, that's just all, the, all these little things, you know, yeah. these little, um, gifts of the spirit to the church that, that just, it's been really to, to explore them, experience them. And then, um, and you know, to, to grow in them has been really reinvigorating. I, I, I can, I can, I mean, it's comparable. It's exceeded now, but uh, the, the closest comparison I have was I think when I was in college at that holiness school and, and um, doing a lot of ministry and really difficult ministry in a difficult, difficult school. Um, and it became apparent to me that I just, I can't do this if I don't pray a lot. And so I just got in the habit of praying and reading my Bible for two hours every morning. Um, and over time, that was really, you know, transformational experience. Um, and this is sort of like that, but, you know, there's like, um, there are a lot of fields to, to, to explore, a lot more yeah. fields to explore than I did at that time, probably. Yeah, I, so, that's, yeah. that's fantastic. Yeah, it's been good. Do you have time for one or two more questions, or what's your time? Yeah, yeah, like? yeah. Okay, I'm not. Okay. Uh, nobody's crying yet, so. Okay. But I'm good. <laughs> that sounds good. This will I'm, be the longest episode ever, too. I'm blissfully so. unaware at this point, so my yeah, I will be <laughs> shortly required. But uh, we'll we'll see. Yeah. we'll see. Our two year old is not is not sleeping, and she's sick right now. Oh too, so. gosh, it's lovely. Okay, so I, I'm wondering. So you, you talked before about the Methodist denomination being kind of rooted in history, right? And, mm -hmm. and a lot of these denominations, a lot of the, the, the Protestant thinking these days, this is more and more common, uh, are, are great Protestants leading the charge to kind of rediscover or, or really reground the, the traditional Protestant faiths in, in church history, in the church mm -hmm. fathers, in ancient practices. At the same time, you see these denominations really liberalizing and splitting apart, right? And, and kind yep. of impl imploding in some cases. But in other cases, they're digging deeper, right? I have friends yep. who, are, who are Anglo Catholics, and, yep. uh, right? And the Anglican church is, is going all kinds of ways, right? right. It's, it's liberalizing and, and, and breaking from tradition and history and scripture. In some yeah. pl some places, and it's deepening its its love right. for the Eucharist and these things in other places. Right. So these, it's a bit it's a bit splintered in some in some cases, yeah. right? But there is this aspect of rediscovering and digging into yeah. the the ancient parts of the church and and yeah. living those out. So I'm wondering for you, what what did you see looking at the the church fathers, looking at your Methodist faith that that wasn't compatible? That somebody that for you you couldn't remain Methodist and be grounded yeah. in, in, in patristics and the church fathers in the, yeah. in that ancient faith. What, what, what was that? Yeah. A few things, a few things, some of them very particular to Methodism. Um, I had, I had a real crisis, maybe my third year teaching. I didn't use a crisis too much. That's my YouTube tits. I had a real, a real conundrum, I guess I should say, um, an intellectual crisis, my, my second or third year teaching, uh, because I was charged to teach, basic Christian doctrine to United Methodist ordinance. So there's a huge problem in the United Methodist Church with respect to basic Christian doctrine, which is the church's doctrinal statement is a giant pile of like pluralism, basically. Okay. Um, you know, the, the United Methodist Church was substantively re, a recreation in 1968, um, where a very t tiny, Evangelical United Brethren Church and a very large Methodist Episcopal Church merged, and um, the kind of intellectual fads of the day among the elite academics and Methodist Episcopal Church institutions were seized this window, it seems to me, and kind of rewrote the books doctrinally. And as a result, if you look at the United Methodist Church's doctrinal statements, um, doctrinal statements, it's it's like this long historical relativization of anything like a creed or an article of faith. And then um, just kind of a, a, a listing of those things, what they've been historically. 
um, pivot over to then what's going to unify us is this really wonky um, <laughs> method we call the quadrilateral, which is actually no method at all. Um, it's just a way to justify any belief under the sun, really. And so I, I just realized, what am I being asked to teach when they tell me to teach Methodist their doctrine? Um, you know, I don't know. I don't know. At that moment, I had, I think this is a real, probably a common Protestant cr um, crisis. I, I realized, well, I had, my, I had an answer. My answer was, well, it's got to be just like, let's just teach that tradition straight up. Okay. Um, let's just say, let's pretend like that historical relativization stuff doesn't exist. Forget the quadrilateral. They just need to believe the articles. That's what I need to teach them to do. And so I have declared it, you know. Um, <laughs> and really, I mean, if I mean, if anyone were bored enough or were pathetic enough to go back and look at my publication record, um, things I've written um, in the first few, three or four years um, on, on the faculty at United, uh, you would see that's the type of thing I was arguing for in the Methodist Church. Um, you know, what we need is a reinvigorated commitment to historic Christianity. Um, we need to we need to follow Wesley's commitment to the earliest church and then expand that out even a little further, you know, because what Wesley had this funny Constantinian thesis um, notion that was pretty common, I think, among appeals to primitive Christianity in the Anglican world that he was in. So then, so I was like, okay, that's what, that's what I need to do. And I've done argue for this ever, you know, where people were mad at me about it and all that, call you, call you a bigot and all that stuff for, for doing this. I did that for several years and it just occurred to me, well, what's determining that's what the Methodist Church is? Like, that's actually the Methodist Church's doctrine. This is just my personal, like, decision, you know. What, by what authority do I right. set the doctrinal, authoritative doctrinal interpretation for this church? And I was like, I have no authority for that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I'm just a, I'm just a theologian in a position, you know. Um and there, I think that like Newman Newman basically just just sucker punched me at that point, you know. Um, especially what he has to say about um, the problem the the problem that Protestantism can't solve is the means whereby the objectivity of the faith impresses itself upon your subject. Yeah. And I felt stuck there. Um, I was the subject. I was making the decision. Now, I'm not in a sola scriptura tradition, right? Um, I had this kind of piece of like historic development I wanted to hold on to, but I was the subject. I was, I was the determining factor at the end of the day, and I couldn't, to what was I going to submit my mind? Um, something which I had kind of constructed. And I think that's really what you see in a lot of these kind of retrieval projects among Protestant theologians these days, um, is an attempt to construct something. Usually, um, you have to have some creativity about where you're going to draw the line about the tradition where you're going to, where you're going to recover, right? You're going to recover, you know, for Wesley up to Constantine, or you're going to go through the first seven ecumenical councils, you know, or East, West, you know, what, what fall story you're going to tell about that. And, um, you know, I'd read enough Newman, um, in, in the essay on the development of doctrine and apologia that I was just realized that I didn't, I didn't know how to, I couldn't overcome those objections. And so then it was sort of, and then, um, to add to the craziness of this, when I was in my most kind of, I, my, my family had entered the church already. I had had that conversation with my Dean and then he had that follow up conversation with, with me. And I was trying to discern how to handle the situation at this point. I was thinking, okay, I'm going forward on this. I was sitting in my office and I received a phone call from the, I don't know, I don't know probably your, your, your viewers don't know much about what's going on in the Methodist church, but the Methodist church is in the midst of a massive schism right now. Um, and the kind of the traditionalist Methodists um, who are basically evangelicals are, are, are leaving. Most, most of them are leaving basically. Um, there's a lot of political stuff going on around it. The, the, the guy who is the leader and kind of head architect of the traditional Methodist church 
and the people that are leaving the denomination and will be forming a new denomination. I think the Global Methodist Church is what they've called it. Calls me when I'm in the midst of all this crisis and asks me to be on the doctrinal committee for the <laughs> Global Methodist Church. And, and so that moment, I, it, was, it was like all that came together in that moment on that phone call. And I just thought, I can't be in a church if I'm writing its doctrine. Right. Oh, I cannot yeah. be in a church if I'm writing its doctrine. And that's really what's going on in these situations. It's, it occurred to me. And so I just said, I, this is probably the stupidest thing ever. You know, this is probably like the most powerful person in evangelical method. You know? <laughs> and calling me in my office, you know, I'm just this piddly professor. And I say, um, well, I'm, I'm willing to serve as a consultant, but I think I'm going to be Catholic <laughs> this time next year. And I want you to know that before you place me on this committee. <laughs> and he said, oh, okay, I, I'll need to think about that. I said, that's fine. You know, reach out if, uh, if reach out if you want to, but you don't have to, if you, do, if you'd make a decision otherwise, you know, and uh, I haven't heard anything since then, of course. Um, but that for me, you know, th that's sort of been, that was, that was really critical in my transition. Yeah. 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 Because that comes to a head, right? Like for me, that's my problem with, with also, you know, I, I tried to live in that space for a bit as evangelical looking at, cause our church was facing an issue of, of same sex marriage. Like quite, quite literally th that was, that was being asked of the pastor and the pastor said, well, I'm not sure what we believe. We were, we were Pentecostal nominally, right? But had kind of drifted away. Mm -hmm. This was a mm -hmm. church plant of a church plant. Yeah. A and it came to a fore, and I began my own journey looking at, trying to piece these together for myself, looking at the sources, the early church, looking at the tradition, mm -hmm. the different denominations, and these kinds of things. And I came to the point where I, where I went myself, I, but I'm the one picking. Like, I'm the one yeah. picking which of these things yeah. fits in the framework that I've, I'm already predetermining. Yeah. Right, and if I if I already go into this thinking one thing, I'm not going to choose things that that go against my view. I'm going to retrieve the things right. that I think line up with me, whether I'm doing that willingly or unwillingly. Right? Yeah. That's For right. you, this comes to a fore when you're asked to literally be the guy to, <laughs> to write the nom you know, to write doctrine, right? And with realization yeah. that what you are what you are looking at. Like you're the one picking and choosing those things, right? And yeah. I don't know a way around that, right? Newman, yeah. Newman, Newman couldn't find one, right? Right. People right. who read who read Newman come to the same conclusion. I don't know that there is a way around that. That if you're looking yeah. to retrieve things from the ancient church, you are ultimately your own arbiter of what you're what you're taking right. taking in, no matter your best intentions or your best. Right. Uh, I don't know. Committee you yeah. struck. Of I, I think people. that's. I don't know. I mean, that's, that's just fine if you're just a theologian, you know, I mean, like that's, that's, that's what I do, you know, I, I'm doing this kind of retrieval work, but, um, Rome gives me the doctrinal magisterial mechanism, you know, right. um, to, to guide me in that. And that's what the Methodist church couldn't offer me. Right. Um, I think, I, think, I, I don't want to bash, I, mean, I actually love a lot of this. I love this evangelical retrieval work that's going on. I, I assign a lot of those books actually to my students um, um, because they're accessible. I actually think, you know, some of, some of, these, some of these scholars, they're writing, um, they're write, they, they, they've got an eye to scripture and its foundation um, and its reception in, in the fathers that I don't always see in Catholic scholars sometimes. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I want to celebrate that work and I use it a lot. Um, and, and I, and I think it will, I think that I, I do believe that, um, like Tom Oden was a figure in Methodism who was really into, into this retrieval of the, of the early church. And he, he was the one the, the main editor for the, um, was the, the commentary on the early Christian commentary on scripture. If you've seen that mammoth series and that was, that was a hugely important series in English actually, because it generated a ton of research uh, careers for people on early Christian biblical commentaries that we're getting the fruit of now in, in the English language. And he's a, he's a United Methodist Tom Oden was. Um, so I, I think, I think he was right that embedding yourself in the world of the early church, um, gives you a fu the fullness of the gospel in a way that you don't get with just scripture you know, alone. Um, but then, you know, my question just became like, well, gosh, you know, what happened in the middle ages? You know, <laughs> like why, 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 
why did the spirit become impotent all of a sudden? Like, what happened there? Like, what was what's going on? And and then you know, I, I mostly work in the Middle Ages, so is where I kind of landed. And I was like, well, wow, the spirit is doing all kinds of amazing stuff in the church. You know, it's renewing the church over and over and over and over again, um, and and giving the church new gifts over and over and over again. Um, not new gifts; they're all grounded in the in the in the in the in the deposit of faith. You know, the script is, they're all grounded in the scriptures, but you know, just just keeps giving more and more stuff. And and I didn't know about all this stuff, you know. And so I think that kind of that was that was really critical for me, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. Okay. One more question for you. And, I, and it's this, I'm thinking of that person listening to the show. Who's, I, I don't know where they're at, but who's looking at the, the weird thing we're doing here. Who's like, why, why would a Methodist theologian ever become Catholic? Like who, who, who's this guy? And they've now heard you in a record breaking, uh, record breaking story that you told, which was fantastic <laughs> by the, by the way, what would you say maybe in closing to a person who's kind of looking at this thing and going like, why, why can't I just stay what I am? Is this okay? What, what benefit? And I mean, you've already given us lots of benefits and things I think that are beautiful about becoming Catholic, but is there one, is there something else you want to kind of say in, in closing to kind of, I don't know, pitch, pitch that thing, what you and your family had discovered in this, in this conversion process? Yeah. Well, what's the one thing that's hard to say? I, I do think, I do think, um, Attending the mass and learning about the mass and the Eucharist is, I think that's probably a common trend for all, I would guess for all your speakers. And I, I remember the, I don't remember the, t the date. I don't remember any dates. I'm, I don't know how I end up in history. <laughs> um, but I, I remember the feeling um, sitting in mass after, you know, after attending for months, maybe, and that would be my first piece of advice, by the way, if you're, if you're curious, just go to mass, you know, and see what's going on and see what people are doing. And, you know, um, I, it's the best place to go and have the, the questions that you need to think about provoked. Does that make sense? You're going to see all sorts of weird stuff. Like, Oh, why do they do that? Why do they do that? What is that about? What are you supposed to do here? You know? Um, and I think that's the best way to learn about Catholicism is sort of to get in there and, and ask questions, um, what, for what you're seeing. But the, um, I remember sitting there and the, it suddenly hit me. This is what hit me all my life. I've been pursuing Christ. I want to be as closely united to Christ as possible. And it just struck me all of a sudden, if that's Jesus on the altar, and that's the thing I care about most, that I, that's most important to me, n n no other question matters after, beyond that right now. Like That's the question. Is that really Jesus? And if it is, how can I not want to be united to him as much as possible? And... I think that's the question to wrestle with. That, that was a question. Um, that's a really important question to wrestle with. If that's Jesus, yeah. that's all that matters. If that's Jesus, um, you, you know, that's all that matters. <laughs> that's, that's a fantastic point. That deserves underscoring several, several times. I think of my first encounter going to adoration, right? Where we as Catholics mm -hmm. believe mm -hmm. that Christ is present in the Eucharist. And so the Eucharist is consecrated by a priest in mass. We, we put that as Catholics on this giant thing on the altar, which is kind of crazy, right? And, and I'm thinking of my Pentecostal background, you know, altar calls were a thing we did, right? Yeah. We, call, we call them the altar calls. You, you go and you, you go to the front and someone prays over you and yep. you experience Christ at this. There never was an altar, right? We, did, we didn't even have <laughs> anything like that. <laughs> the church just ripped them all out by then. Yeah, yeah. We'd have altar calls, right? Yeah. And here I am, my first experience of adoration, where there's an actual altar and there's actually Jesus in the Eucharist, in the sacrament, on the altar. Like, gosh, that altar call, I mean, yeah. eclipsed all the yeah. altar calls combined of my of my teenage Pentecostal youth, right? That was like, that, and then I, like you said, you know, if this is where Christ is, like, I want to be as close to that yeah. as possible. Like, yeah. I can, man, <laughs> it gives me goosebumps. Yeah, we did, we, we do a, we do a, uh, a Eucharistic procession uh, for the Feast of Corpus Christi in our, in our church. Um, out in the street around yeah. the church, yeah. and um, so the Eucharistic procession is, you know, the priest 
takes takes the um, the host, you know, Christ's body, and and carries it, you know, in this this ornate thing called a monstrance, and um, that's probably more or less ornate depending where you're at, and and walks through the street. And uh, I remember, I remember we participated in this, you know, because I said, all right, we're going to do this. We're going to go to this stuff, you know, and this is big at our parish that we're not a part of. But they do this Eucharistic procession is a huge part of their, their life. And so we're going to do it. And, you know, we're out there kneeling on the street every time the every time every time the procession passes us, you know, and uh, and. And I just thought, man, this this is different. Yeah. This is this is not. This is not, you know, what I've experienced in the past, and I got, I got, I got to figure out more about this, <laughs> you know. Um, but that's exactly right. I mean, it's, it's, it's just yeah. a posture towards Christ yeah. in the Eucharist. Yeah, it's quite yeah. something. Absolutely. Okay, one last last question, okay? Because this yep. has occurred to be here because we are we were similar to to you and your wife and your family in this respect that we were very involved in our church mm-hmm. and became Catholic. And I, the first the first Catholic parish that I was you know I actually was confirmed in the RCA, which was the first one that was closest to us, and I just went there and and joined. I had no idea they're all different. I, I should have known. <laughs> yeah. The first one on the list, beautiful church, gorgeous. The RCA program, the church as itself, the 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 parishioners, it was it was an old person church. It was a yeah, lot of old people. Yeah. There are no families there. There's nothing going on there. They had it. They the only program they had was called adult child minding, which I think I think was old people <laughs> holding their baby during mass. I think it actually was. And I and I mean, so our baby could have been held, but that was but yeah. that was all it was for families, really, right? Was this, was this concierge <laughs> service? <laughs> We we found a church and got plugged in that had vibrant things going on. It had a, had a catechesis of the Good Shepherd. It had a youth group. It had yeah. a kids yeah, yeah. ministry. It had small groups. It had men's groups. It had things for us to plug into apart from the the important mass. But then right. to build a community around that discipleship, right? Yeah. Walking together as Catholic Christians. Was that for you guys a struggle to find? Because it was for us for a bit, and we felt like, and honestly, a lot of the letters I get to the show and, and emails, I'm getting letters, I get emails and, and notes, are people going, how, yeah. how do I find yeah. this? Yeah. I don't want to leave yeah. my church yeah, and then absolutely. leave my kids stranded in the Catholic church. Absolutely. Did, did you guys, what was yeah. your experience of that? Well, you, I think you're exactly right. I have a lot of friends for whom this, this, this is a real yeah. challenge yeah. for them, yeah. um, what you're describing. And it is true that, I mean, you know, in some ways, I left the, the mainline Protestantism um, and its challenges. In other ways, you know, Ro- Rome has been dealing with those challenges in America for quite some time. Similar set of challenges in America. Um, you know, I, th- I think our our situation was a little unique because we came in through those kind of extension ministries. Yeah, is yeah. how we, that was our our gate our on ramp. Um, the homeschool, for instance, I mean, the, we just. There happens to be a uh, set of priests who just felt called to supporting the homeschool ministry in Dayton, and it's boomed. I don't know. I don't know how many hundred, several hundred families, maybe five hundred families. I think are connected to this. Now they don't all go to our parish, but a lot of them do, and um, and that has been like that's kind of yeah, built yeah. this whole network around. Um, around the ordinary you know functions of the church and so that's been our, we haven't really struggled with that i know friends who have we do i mean we do sometimes walk there's a ma- there's a there's a parish down the street from us and we will walk and go to mass um there relatively frequently when the weather permits um and that's much more of i i, I sometimes joke and say I'm, we're gonna go to the united methodist catholic church this week um <laughs> because you know it's you know it's gray hair People have one or two kids. It feels very. It feels very much. It's still a mass, um, but that would be a harder place for us to find our way in. I think. Um, so I, I hate to give. I, I struggle on how to advise people. They've asked me this question too, in part because geographic yeah. geography matters a ton. If I were in the South, uh, this would be a real challenge. I think. Um, but I live in Dayton, Ohio. There are like, I can get to it. I can get to. There are probably masses. 10 minutes from my house seven times a day, you know, um, like seven, seven, eight different parishes. And so it's a little different for us that way. I, I wish I could offer more counsel, um, to people in that respect. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes sense. And, and then 
you know, I love that it's those kind of groups that drew you in, right? You you kind of had the what's the expression that the cart first, and then the horse, like right? The yeah. the thing that you yeah you need to plug into. You got that first, and then right. Right, that that I think that's amazing. That's I that's I awesome. do think that, I do think that it's I do think that increasingly, um, and this is something I have told told friends and they've had some success with. Increasingly, everything in America is the same in this way. Um, you can start communities online. You can find communities online, and uh, that's probably the best method to find it. Find out, you know, what's the closest place where um, a kind of dynamic, whatever station of life you're in, type um, community yeah. is existing. For for I have friends in freaking South Dakota, in the middle of nowhere, you know, and they found these communities through through networks. But you have to kind of you gotta be you gotta be proactive, you know, and you also have, or you have to eat word of mouth. You know, I have to ask word of mouth because um, Catholics aren't always the most cutting edge in. Uh, and I mean, you're 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 obviously you're obviously cutting edge technology, but you know, there might be really robust, healthy systems of families that are just like have email list serves or something yeah. like that connecting yeah. them. And so I think finding that stuff um, it takes some proactivity, but it's really really worth it. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I can give my fax number at the end of this episode, by the way, if anybody wants to send a fax this yeah, way. That's, right. that's That's available. <laughs> Listen, uh, Dr. Hunter, this has been a real pleasure to have you on the show. I'm glad we connected. I wasn't steered wrong by listeners who said you'd be a great <laughs> guest to have on the show. <laughs> yeah, it's, you can. Uh, yeah, you can settle down now. I'm. I'm. I'm relieved also to learn to learn that, and uh, I'll let Tish know that you've overtaken her fabulous record with uh, your own uh, triumphant uh, story. <laughs> that was a great one. Um, I don't know if you want to point anybody towards any place where they can find or follow you. Uh, mm -hmm. Anything you want to you want to point listeners towards? Yeah, I'm on. I mean, you can find my faculty bio at at uh, united.edu. Uh, it's Justice Hunter J U S T U S. I'm sure you'll have all that on there. Um, and you can just find my email address that way and shoot me an email. I'm a bit of a. Uh, I have a Twitter. Um, but I, I only use it export really. It's as I, I just post when I'm doing, th when I'm doing event, I doing events and like coordinating things and publishing things. I don't really dialogue very much through Twitter. So you, you could send me a message through there, but I won't see it very often. It's better yeah. to send me an email. So that's what I would recommend. Yeah, that's true. But I can, uh, yeah, I answer I can, my emails. Can... I'm up at 3am with kids all the time. <laughs> looking at so, you know. It's good time for administrative work. I hear <laughs> right. you, man. Listen, thank you so much for being here. This has been an absolute pleasure. I'm happy to meet you, happy to talk to you. This has been a lot of fun for me personally, and I think for listeners as well. Uh, we'll enjoy this. I want to say God bless you and the work you're doing for the church, and thank you so much. Thank you, Kate.